today's video we're going to be going through how an x-ray works all right so i'm just going to do some notes in uh, one note for you so we're just going to explain the whole process from where to go and hopefully um, it'll make sense to you okay as we go through this all right so i've just got a schematic of an x-ray tube here uh, probably the main things with this is looking at the cathode Okay, so the cathode is actually negative charged over here. So it's made up of the filament. The filament basically produces electrons. Okay, the electrons are then accelerated across towards the anode, the positive anode, uh, and we use a high voltage. Okay, so in here we use a very high voltage. Um, and so those electrons are going to be going quite quickly. And they're aimed at a, a tungsten target now with the reason why we use tungsten is uh, these electrons are going to cause the metal to get very very hot so we need a metal that doesn't melt at low temperature so we have a very high voltage accelerating electrons towards the metal target um, now in that whole process about 99 percent of the energy that's produced is converted to heat all right, so it's not a very efficient process. So over here, you'll note that we have these cooling fans. All right, so any machine, any x-ray machine is going to need to have a really good cooling system with it. All right, so essentially that's what happens <coughs> in the machine. Now, this is obviously evacuated tube. We don't want air particles messing with the, um, with the electrons. So they get aimed towards that metal target. And then we're going to talk about what happens inside the metal now. All right, so I'll come down to this diagram here. All right, so in the metal, the metal's made up of delocalized electrons. So you have these positive nuclei. And depending on how close you get to the nuclei, um, as to how much the electron will get slowed down. So these electrons over here, so in the case number one, the electron sort of going towards the middle gets slowed down a bit by the attraction to the positive nuclei. As it slows down, it ejects these photons. Okay, so this is a photon that's being produced. All right, in case number two, uh, what happens is it gets closer to the nuclei, and so therefore it's going to slow down more, producing photon number three, right, number two there. Okay, and that's going to have more energy than the other two, than the other photon. And then case number three, case number three is when it's going to have the maximum amount of energy that it can actually have. And that's to do with the fact that it actually hits the nuclei itself. It gives up all of its energy. And so therefore you're going to get a maximum photon being produced. All right, so that's the case of producing a, a, a photon. Now the photon is what we classify as the unknown particle, the X-ray, and that is in fact uh, just a bundle of light or called a photon. Now if you look at the spectrum that you produce here, it's got a continuous spectrum. All right, so if I just copy the bottom one here, so you've got this particular shape here. Now that there corresponds to hitting hitting the nuclei. All right, so that is the maximum energy that you actually get uh, due to the electron hitting the nuclei and giving up all of its energy to the nucleus. Now, why is it continuous? Okay, why is this continuous? Well, it's continuous because if you think about this, between these particular nuclei, it can have any different distance. So therefore, as it can have any distance there, you can produce any particular uh, range of energies, okay, because it will slow down at a certain amount. All right, now obviously there is a more likely scenario. See, it goes to a max here, this point here. So that is the maximum, well, it's the most common distance from between the two nuclei that it's going to get. But we get a continuous spectrum 
because of the fact that it can have continuous distances from the nuclei. And obviously how much it slows down will be causing the energy the photon that actually produces. All right, Does that makes sense? Hopefully it does make sense. Now obviously the higher the accelerating potential difference will cause the, the greater um, energy x-ray. All right, so if you increase the potential difference of the accelerating electron, and we're talking about the, the distance between uh, the cathode and the anode. All right, so if you have a potential difference between those two, if you increase that, make that greater, in other words, you'll increase the speed of the electrons, therefore you'll allow them to lose more energy which is probably the, the main thing we need to look at. Now, notice in the spectrum here, we get these spikes, okay? So we're talking about little, these little spikes here, okay? These little spikes here occur at different particular frequencies. Well, why does that actually happen like that? Well, I'm going to go to uh, some other notes that I had just to explain that to you. Um, so if we come down to here, right, so this is again the idea of the electron slowing down. Right, so what happens in for these spikes to occur? Well, these spikes occur due to the fact that it could, in fact, hit an electron. Okay, we know around each one of these positive nuclei, we actually have, around each, each of these nuclei, we actually have electron shells. And so what could happen is the electron could, in fact, hit another electron. All right, so if it hits the electron out, so let's say it hit this electron out here, then what's going to happen is that's going to go out. And then what we find is that this electron from the upper shell will fall down. And as that electron falls down, it's going to eject a photon of energy. And that will be equivalent to the energy gap between the two energy levels. Okay, we know that every element has a specific characteristic, uh, and the electrons are held at certain distances from the nuclei. So it could actually hit that electron out. Here it could hit that electron out. All right, depending on what the element is and and how far it is from there. So we have um, a scenario where uh, we're talking about these spikes. These spikes, they are characteristic to each particular metal that you use. And that's due to the fact that the electron could hit and we're looking at the energy gap between the two shells. And come back to our diagram here. All right, so that accounts for the spikes. Now, there are other two terms that you need to know about that are pretty important. And the first term is called the attenuation. Let's write this. No, we'll come down a little bit further down here. All right, so get a bit of space in here. All right, so you'll need to come up with your own definition of attenuation, but I'm going to tell you what it is. Ten. If I can spell that would help. Attenuation. Now, obviously x-rays are pretty useful in terms of they can go through different uh, different media. All right, so the attenuation is to do with the absorption. Okay, it's so the absorption of the x-ray. All right, so the attenuation of an x-ray or the absorption of an x-ray is to do with a couple of things. The first thing being the thickness of the particular material that you're going into and the second thing is going to be the density all right so we know that you get a nice image with a bone because uh if you're thinking about the muscles of an x of, of 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 you know a human uh that has a different density than say the the, the calcium of the bones all right so therefore you get a a different image there and obviously if you've ever seen a metal uh, then obviously x-rays will be absorbed more in a metal than they would be on bone. So the, the denser the material or the thick, thicker the material, then 
the more attenuation that you get of the x-ray or the absorption of the x-ray. So that's the first term that we need to be looking at in terms of understanding about x-rays. Now obviously uh, our goal will be to provide the least amount of the least amount of energy uh, to take the x-ray so we cause the least amount of damage to the patient. Um, obviously the other thing that we need to talk about is the hardness of the x-ray. Right, so these are the two terms. The hardness of an x-ray is to do with the energy of the x-ray. Right, so the energy of the x-ray will be to do with the potential, the accelerating potential between the cathode and the anode. All right, so the hardness of the x-ray will be determined by what you're going to be going through. All right, so we know in, say, customs, customs can actually use x-rays to go through a shipping container. All right, so they, they actually have a shipping container off the ship. They run it through a big machine and they can actually x-ray what's inside the shipping container. Now, the energy required for that x-ray would be totally different from the x-ray that you might have when you go down to have to see if your arm's broken. All right, so by playing around with the attenuation, knowing what you're going to be looking at, and then looking for the hardness of the x-ray, looking at the energy of the x-ray you're going to be producing, you can make that x-ray safer for the patient. Now, depending what you're going to do, um, I want to probably try and take an x-ray which is quite short, so therefore I have to make a, uh, a balance between the exposure time and how much energy I provide. So I get a nice sharp image because you know we want the patient to be nice and nice and still when we do that. So we get a nice, nice good image. Then we can make a decision about if there's a break in the arm or in the leg or whatever. All right. So that's that's uh, pretty well how X-rays work. <clears throat> Obviously, most of us probably have had an X-ray at some stage, so we do sort of understand it from the patient side. Um, but the physics behind it's quite it's quite cool, and uh, obviously <clears throat> being able to use these X-rays now they do have a lot of uses apart from you know the most obvious. So if you were going to do this money applications, you might be looking at all the other types of applications with that. Um, and then obviously we've also got X-rays that can be taken, so they give a three D model rather than just a two D model. All right, so hopefully this makes sense to you. If you've got any questions, make sure you catch up with me in class.